Hi, everyone. I'm Carlota Pico from The Content Mix, and I'm excited to be here today with Sarah Evans, who is HERE's former global social media manager and has over 10 years of experience in marketing and communications. Welcome, Sarah, and thank you so much for joining us today on The Content Mix. Thanks so much for having me. It's our pleasure. Sarah, let's jump straight into the interview. To get this interview started off, I'd like to learn a little bit about your background and what makes you passionate about marketing. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say my love affair with marketing began when I was about 14 and I watched a movie called What Women Want. Um, It's Helen Hunt and Mel Gibson for anyone that hasn't seen it. Um, And in that movie, they are um, ad execs, uh, not quite Mad Men era, but a little later than that. And uh, there was just something about the way that they were trying to connect with consumers and to find out what makes people tick. Um, And the phrase from that movie uh, for the ad campaign they came up with was no games, just sports. And that has just stuck with me ever since. Uh, So that's where it all began. Um, I then went on to do a degree in marketing management at the University of Gloucestershire in the UK. Um, And as part of that, I did a year in industry um, and I actually got a job in San Francisco of all crazy places to end up. And so I spent a year there when I was 21. And as you could probably imagine, it was a pretty epic year. Um, And the cliche is true. And I left my heart in San Francisco and made it my passion um, and my goal to move back. Um, So after graduating, I was able to find a job that would bring me back to the US. Um, And from there, I worked uh, across uh, the wine industry, the insurance industry, and then came back over to the UK where I worked for TUI um, in Luton for about a year and a half. And then most recently, I moved on to my role as global social media manager at Peer Technologies, which was a maternity cover contract that I did in Berlin. Um, And I've just wrapped that up and now heading back to the Bay Area and looking for my next opportunity out there. Quite a diverse background. You've touched upon lots of different industries and within the marketing field. And and it must be really great to be able to provide all that value from all those different uh, experiences to your future employers. Yeah, I think it's been really interesting, actually, to try uh, both. I've been now in the B2C space as well as the B2B space. Uh, just moving into the tech world most recently was really interesting and was a very uh, cognizant decision that I made because I wanted to try something different. And it was a really interesting experience. So it paid off. Um, but I, I think that having a diverse Um, range of experiences across industries can be really, really powerful, Um, primarily because we're all talking to people. It doesn't really matter who we're talking to or what we're talking to them about. We're talking to people. And I think people is really what's uh, at the very heart of what we do in marketing. And it doesn't really matter if that's travel or insurance or wine. It's the same thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. We will be talking about business to human marketing later into our interview. But for the moment, I'd like to talk about your experience at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. So I watched your video on LinkedIn about how here helped attendees navigate the Consumer Electronics Show, and I was highly impressed. So congratulations on that because, I mean, you really made a success out of that campaign. Um, But I am curious about how a business-to-business company appealed to consumer audience. So to start off this section of the interview, I'd like to talk a little bit about your relationship uh, with CES. So what did that look like? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we were a sponsor of CES and have been for many years. And the the, um, primary thing that we get with that is a really nice big booth, sexy booth um, right by the convention center. And it gives people the opportunity to come and experience what we do as a business, what what our product offering is. Um, And as you mentioned, it is the consumer electronic show. So there very much is a consumer focus, um, whereas Here Technologies is in the B2B space. Now, what Here Technologies does is in the space of location technology. And we have kind of a unique problem in that uh, awareness of Here Technologies is really low. But in addition to awareness of Here Technologies being low, awareness of location technology in general is also extremely low. So we sort of have this double-edged sword between both category awareness and then also brand awareness being our challenge. So um, what we wanted to do was really cut through the clutter at CES and um, be part of the conversation. Um, And that's no easy thing to do when you are on a stage next to the world's biggest tech brands uh, and it becomes a very expensive paid media environment. Everyone's vying for your attention, both 
in person and on your phone. Um, and so we really have to sort of think outside the box as to how we can reach people. Okay. Um, I do, of course, want to zoom into this because it is a great case study to uh, push out or to show and talk about to our with our audience and with you. So since this was a first for here, because I'm under, uh, I'm under the understanding that this was a first for here, thanks to our conversation off the record, how did you determine what success looked like for your company and also for your clients? Yeah, so I think one of the things for us is we wanted to do something different. So Here Technologies has been at CES as a sponsor, as an exhibitor for the last couple of years, um, but we wanted to extend the on-site footprint digitally in a way that we never had done before. Um, And so I think one of the the biggest things we wanted to accomplish uh, was share a voice. We wanted to be part of the conversation. We wanted our brand to cut through. Um, And obviously, you can't do that simply by having a really cool, sexy booth. You have to think about how do you you extend that beyond. Um, And so for us, success really looked like being part of that conversation. Um, And I think to do that, we really needed to ensure that we created timely, relevant content that would really resonate with the audience. Um, I think part of that is not trying to create a conversation, but instead be part of one that's already happening. Um, And so that was really the focus for us is how do we insert ourselves into a conversation versus just try and create something from scratch. So how did you insert yourself into a conversation? Did you use different social networks or was there a CES app that you were engaging on? So what we tried decided to do uh, was social listening. That was where it all started. So we partnered with an agency, um, Three Monkey Zeno, out of London, and we came up with this idea, which was to listen to conversations from CES years past to understand people's pain points, to understand what are people talking about when they go to CES, when they're physically on the ground in Vegas, what are they saying? And what became very quickly apparent was that while everyone loves all the new tech and the experience of being there, it's hot, it's big, it's overwhelming, it's tiring, uh, you're on your feet all day, it can be hard to get things to eat. And what we realized was that we had a real opportunity there to add some value. So as I mentioned previously, uh, Here Technologies is in the business of location. And, and really what we do at a very simple level is get people and goods from A to B. So uh, think about having your Domino's pizza delivered or having your Amazon parcel show up at your door when it says it's going to. The technology behind those services can be powered by here. Uh, so we thought, well, what, what if we could solve people's problems real time on the ground in Vegas using uh, a technology that's like ours? Um, so that's where it started. And what we did was to set the scene, we took uh, people's real tweets from 2019 and we created little animated videos that really set the scene of people saying, you know, the hottest thing at CES this year is going to be me melting from all the walking between exhibits. Um, and we animated them where you could see people sort of uh, on a treadmill getting hotter and hotter and the sweat flying off and the step count racking up. Um, and that was really a, a way to set the scene and say, hey, Vegas, we hear you. We know the struggles that you're facing and we're here to help. Uh, So that was sort of how we set the scene in advance. And then what we did was set up a war room on the ground in Vegas during the event where we were able to uh, pull in a feed of conversation that was happening on Twitter and engage with people real time. So the guy who said, oh, man, I really wish I'd brought another pair of running shoes with me because these ones are going to be burned out by tomorrow. We said, tell us where you are. We will deliver you a pair of shoes right now. And then we would have our team on the ground, go and get the shoes, deliver them to the person exactly where he is. And that is a representation in a very, very loose, light and sort of consumer way of representing last mile delivery, which is a product offering that we have, which is getting things to people just in time. Um, So we ran that then on the ground um, throughout the event. So basically, you use this event as an example to show your future clients of what you're capable of doing. Um, And so that's why you invested so much cash into all these different freebies and also developing all these different graphics and assets before the actual event. Is that correct? So it was kind of like a lead generation uh, type of structure or business. Yes and no. 
I would say it was more about brand awareness than for lead generation. The lead generation component of the campaign very much lived on site at the exhibit itself. And what we were trying to do with our campaign on social was say, hey, we're here. This is what we do. This is who we are. These are the kinds of products and services that we offer because people really don't get what location technology is, even though you know we have it in our hand constantly with Uber and, 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 and all the things we use on a daily basis. Um, people don't necessarily necessarily put two and two together and say, oh, this is actually something that I could have that would improve my product offering and help me better reach and serve my clients. Um, and so this was a very, very loose way of us doing that. So if you think you've got a spectrum over here is selling here technologies, products and services. And then up here is building awareness of our brand uh, in a way that really connects with the human interaction and it's the human payoff. We wanted to say this guy getting his running shoes in the convention center is probably not actually what we're going to sell you, but it's a way of demonstrating the human payoff of our products and services. Sarah, I love this. I mean, what a brilliant, brilliant campaign, but obviously to put something like this into action uh, requires a lot of brainstorming and also a lot of thinking outside of the box. So how did you approach that challenge? Before all of this started, what did you do? What was the first thing that you did in order to start thinking like humans instead of as a company? Yep. So we really wanted to focus on the meeting point between the event and our brand. And so I think whenever we approach content, we need to think about this intersection, which is, you know, what is this event doing? What do we do? And all of these people that are attending this event, what's going to be of interest and relevant to them? And so for us, when we first started thinking about how to approach this campaign, it was, where is that intersection? What, what is that? And where do we add value? Um, and I think one of the most important things is that we needed to be relevant to our brand. We, you know, we couldn't just start doing something that was super relevant to CES, but then not very connected to us because that wouldn't do the job of raising our awareness. Um, but at the same time, it needed to first and foremost be relevant to the audience. It needed to be very customer centric. And that was a really, really big focus for Here Technologies while I was there, which was around how to be more and more customer centric. Um, and instead of saying, we need to sell, we would instead reverse that and say, you know, how can we serve the needs of our customer? And so that was really where our brainstorming started was, you know, how can we do that? Um, second of all, uh, we're very much a challenger brand. So Here Technologies is playing in the space with the likes of Google and Apple, um, who are, of course, huge brands with huge consumer presence already. Um, and so we needed to very much get clever with our budgets because we simply didn't have the money um, to compete in the same way, which was a very similar experience I had when working um, with eSurance, uh, an insurance brand in the US previously, where uh, might have big budgets in the insurance world, but you don't have the same budgets as your competitors. Um, and that's really how we ended up going down the social listening um, route, because to be honest, it's actually free. All of the information is right there. All of the conversation exists. And all we needed to do was tap into that and build something out of it. Um, and there was no uh, costs for shooting of content. There was no actors needed. There was no on location needed. We built really awesome animations, working with a fantastic animation studio. Um, and then to be honest, in terms of the on the ground um, sort of surprise and delight component, we didn't spend huge amounts of money. This was not a big, splashy, fancy campaign. Um, it was just about sort of being clever and, and, and getting people the things that they needed in that right moment. Um, and you don't have to have a huge budget to do that. Okay. So you've been speaking a lot about brand awareness. Uh, how did you measure brand awareness, the success of this campaign, and what results did you achieve? So uh, I think one of the, of the shifts that we're seeing in the social space is that more often than not, people aren't so concerned with engagement anymore. Engagement isn't really the thing that matters. A lot of it is all about lead generation and how many clicks through to site are you getting and are people progressing in their journey. But uh, with the goal of this campaign, it really was about getting people to engage with us. Uh, we wanted people to know that we exist. And a pretty good way of identifying awareness is when people have engaged with your content. Um, so that was a really big piece for us because we wanted people to watch the videos. Um, we wanted them to, uh, to engage with us, to respond, to retweet, to comment on our content. Um, and we focused on Twitter uh, throughout the event because of the real time nature of the platform. It's an excellent place to be um, when it's kind of in terms of a conversation that's happening there. And then, again, going back to my point of don't try and build it. Uh, if it already exists, just be part of it, um, which is why we tapped into Twitter through this. 
And we managed to drive over 5 million uh, video views throughout the event. Um, and we managed to do that at a cost per view of one, one cent. Uh, so it was not, again, it was not. And that's pretty impressive considering the nature of the event. Uh, it's a very expensive paid media marketplace because you've got all the big band brands competing for everyone's attention at the same time. Uh, so I think that that we were really happy with. Um, and we also measured our uh, performance based on years past uh, as kind of an indicator of have we improved uh, with the focus on this different and new campaign? Uh, did that have an impact? And uh, amazingly, we managed to increase engagements 862%, which is one of those metrics you're like, I feel like I'm going to check that 17 times because it doesn't sound right, <laughs> but it was. Um, and we also increased brand mentions 81%, um, and we achieved a 65% share of voice, uh, which meant that we were part of the conversation. People were sharing our content, even if that was just via a retweet. It meant that we were extending the reach of our content and getting it in front of the right people. This is so exciting. How long did the event uh, last? So the event is, it's pretty much just three days, actually. So everyone's there for a week, really. But the event itself is just uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, for the most part. Okay. And what type of, uh, how many attendees normally go to see? Oh, my goodness. You know, I don't actually know, but it is a huge, huge number. This is the biggest event of its kind um, in the tech space. Um, so it is, it, the Vegas gets completely taken over um, for the event. Wow, this is a wonderful case study. So I do want to talk about business to human marketing because it looks like you applied a lot of business to human marketing in what you did at CES. So according to Oracle's corporation's co-founder and worldwide influencer, Larry Ellison, he claims that human capital management and customer service are the foundations of a successful modern enterprise and that the future is not B2C, not business to customers or B2B, business to businesses, but that it's actually B2H, business to humans. So taking into consideration your social media experience, do you agree with Mr. Ellison? And if so, why? Why is the future of marketing business to human? Yeah, so I don't think I could have said it better myself, really. And my uh, colleagues at Here Technologies, if they watch this, they will chuckle to themselves because this was my my big campaign while I was with the company, um, was really, really trying to make us see that we are talking to human beings. So sure, you might be talking to a director that makes big decisions and signs the checks that are at a big Fortune 500 company, but that person's also a dad that plays soccer with his kids on the weekend and, and you know, enjoys a beer and a curry with his friends on the weekend, um, that's actually the person that you are talking to on social media. Um, social media, it's an innately personal space. You think, what is it that we're doing on social media? We are looking at where we may want to go on holiday with our family. We're looking at what our friends did last weekend. Uh, even on LinkedIn, which is probably the most businessy of the social platforms, it's still about me. It's still about my brand. It's about my my personal work history. It's about where I'm going to work next, who I want to engage with, what I want to read. Um, and so I think that, that brands that acknowledge that and take that into consideration as they content plan are the ones that really win. Um, and I came from the consumer space, and I think that's actually one of the reasons I was hired into this B2B role, was to bring more of that consumer focus to everything that Here Technologies does in the social space. Um, and something that I think we always need to consider is that when we as brands are competing for people's attention on social, we're not competing against our competitors. We're competing against everything else on social. So if that's Nike and Starbucks and my friends. Um, so how do we ensure that our content can compete in that space? And that's really the most important thing for us to think about. And um, Claudia Bates, who was head of technology at um, Fleischmann Hillard, um, which is a, a comms PR agency, I believe. She said that modern B2B marketing needs to appeal to both the hearts and minds. And I think this is a really, really important thing to remember is that decision makers don't leave their personalities at the door when they go to work. You know, they bring their emotions with them. And that's really what we need to be focusing on as marketers, particularly in the social space. Um, and I think that there are a lot of brands that do a really good job of it um, in, in sort of the B2B tech space. I'd really encourage people to take a look at um, a video from Bosch uh, called Like a Bosch. Um, and this is talking about their IoT product. And it's just a really, really funny piece of content that uh, makes people want to sit up and pay attention. 
And uh, ultimately, that's the kind of thing that will position you correctly with your target customer when it comes time to make a decision about what you need to buy. I love it. So what it comes down to it are emotions. It's all about emotions, creating emotions in people. Yep. Excellent. Really? So, Sarah, taking into consideration your very diverse background and also your very successful career up until now, what does the future have in store for you? What's next? Besides obviously moving to the Bay Area, what are you looking for? Yes. Um, that's a great question. And it's something I'm actually spending quite a lot of time in lockdown thinking about in terms of what is next um, for me, having done both the consumer background side of things and moving into the tech space. Um, and I think for me, I realized it doesn't matter what I do um, in terms of the, the subject matter in question. For me, it's all about uh, the attitude of the brand that you work for and the people you work with. Um, it's quite funny because when I used to work in the wine industry in California, people would always ask me questions about work and everyone was really interested. And then I moved over to insurance. And when people would say, oh, what do you do? So I work in insurance. Oh, and how's the weather today? And what did you do at the weekend? No one was interested because it's insurance and it was boring and not interesting. But for me, actually, it was one of the best, best parts of my career was the time that I spent at insurance doing really, really awesome things with really awesome people. So I'm really excited to find an amazing new team uh, in the Bay Area um, and really kind of bring this focus of people and emotions and appealing to what people care about. Um, that's what I'm really looking forward to doing wherever that may be. Um, and it's an interesting time to try and get a job in the US right now. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, definitely. I mean, my American accent isn't by coincidence. I was raised in the US, <laughs> although I am Spanish. And yes, the US is definitely going through an interesting time. But I agree with you. I'm a big fan of the Bay Area. I love California as a state uh, in general. And also left my heart on the East Coast, actually, in Washington, D.C., so hopefully one day my travels and my work will bring me back to where my heart was left off. So yeah, awesome. maybe we'll meet again in the US in time. <laughs> okay, moving into our rapid fire questions, uh, which are basically your recommendations to our audience. Uh, who is a res- what's a resource or an influencer from your country that you really admire and that you'd like to recommend to our audience? Yes. So actually, one that I came across reasonably recently um, is actually an agency. And this is really the first time I've I've ever been able to say this, um, because I think often agencies, no offense, guys, I love you all, but there can be a lot about we just won this award and we just got this award and we just did this great piece of work. And um, this agency is called Born Social. And they're based out of London. And I came across them while researching um, agencies to work with it here. And what I love about these guys is that they add value for me. So as a social media manager, you know what I would like to see is a roundup each month of all the different updates and changes for platforms, because it's kind of hard to keep track of all of that stuff. These guys do that. Um, They write white papers, which are really, really interesting and insightful. They hold webinars. Um, They have interesting tidbits on their Twitter feed. And so for me, um, they've been a really great resource. And I've really, really appreciated the fact that they are not sometimes the self-serving mindset that you can come across an agency. They're very, very different to that. So I really love that. Um, In terms of something that's just funny, I'd encourage everyone to follow Don Draper if you don't already. It's just really amusing content, which you say... That's painfully true. Um, And uh, I think in terms of something that's a bit more escapism, which is not so much um, about social media necessarily, is um, How I Built This by Guy Raz, the podcast series, which I just find to be a really, really inspiring uh, thing to listen to if you're on a walk or you're commuting on the train, driving. Um, I think that that's just a really, really great way to sort of start and end your day, feeling super inspired by the stories of, of how great brands are built. Excellent. What about a book or a publication or an event that you'd love to attend again or Mm. or read again? Yeah, so I would say last year I was lucky enough to attend Web Summit in Lisbon. Um, No idea if it's happening now this year. I'm assuming probably not, but maybe a virtual version. Um, And I went actually for work. So Here Technologies um, sponsored the event. And so I went in that capacity. But while I was there, I was also able to attend a lot of really great sessions and heard from CMOs of Burger King, J.P. Morgan Chase, SAP, um, and actually thought that was a really nicely run event. So I'd really encourage anyone, if they have the opportunity to participate in that, either in person or virtually, um, that it's well worth doing. Um, And one other thing, actually, which is something that just occurred to me because it came up yesterday again, was um, Adweek Chats. 
So this, this is definitely probably something that comes from a US focus, but Adweek um, does a chat at, I think it's Wednesday afternoon, um, and they, they ask different questions and you can kind of engage with your response. And it can be a really fun way to sort of learn from your peers um, in a really conversational back and forth way. So I'd recommend that to you. Wonderful. Well, actually, I was in Lisbon last year as well for the Web Summit, and I loved it. I had so much fun. I was there for work as well. Uh, and actually, the Web Summit is going to be taking place online this year for our audience who's now tuning into our podcast. So anybody who wants to join can virtually join the Web Summit 2020, uh, which I believe they're going to be making a, making it as a free event. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, that's a big deal. Yes, definitely. Get get involved for sure. Definitely. Okay. Well, we are at the end of our interview, Sarah. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show and learning about your experience and that awesome case study at CES. I mean, talk about thinking outside of the box. You really nailed it. So congratulations once again, and thank you for joining us on the Content Mix. Thanks so much for having me. And to everyone listening in, for more perspectives on the content marketing industry in Europe, check out The Content Mix. We'll be releasing interviews just like this one every week. So keep on tuning in and see you next time. Bye.